calories are cheap actually calories calories are not very expensive people have done the calculation certainly in the uk where we can get on average for 90p which is pretty close to a euro right we can get nearly 900 to a thousand calories it is the quality of the food that's the problem rather than necessarily purely the amount of food when you are going to eat a chocolate bar can we make a healthier chocolate bar Welcome to the 25th episode of Apple Finch Pudding, your gateway into the world of science. Today's scientist is Jael Yeo, a professor of molecular neuroendocrinology at the University of Cambridge. His work focuses on the link between genetics and our appetites. Giles also received an MBE for services to research communication and engagement. He is a science presenter at the BBC for programs like Trust Me, I'm a Doctor, and he is the author of books like Gene Eating and Why Calories Don't Count. Welcome, Giles. Jeroen, thank you so much for having me on. Before we start, do you have a fun science fact for our listeners? A fun science fact? Yes. It, 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 uh, yes. <laughs> why, 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 don't we, why don't we say yes? Did you know that most of the world, so you know lactose intolerance, so I'm Chinese, I'm Chinese. Okay, ethnically Chinese. Um, and so I can't drink a lot of milk. I know you guys like your milk. Okay. But what's interesting is I think that's a little bit of a misnomer because all of us clearly are mammals and could drink milk as little babies. Okay. Obviously. But as it turns out, every single mammal, every single mammal, including two thirds of human beings, become lactose intolerant once they become adults. Okay. However, because so it, K cats, dogs, you know, all of them. But it's interesting is the reason why one third of the adult human population, including people of white Northern European descent, can drink it is because there was a mutation that actually came into 7,500 years ago or so. Um, so lactose, which is the sugar in milk, needs to be metabolized into glucose and galactose. Then we can absorb it. Okay, It sits on the... And lactase is the enzyme that does this. Now, what happens is lactase is turned on in babies and all mammals, but it's turned off. So here's the lactase gene. It's turned off by a protein that comes up here and shuts the damn thing off Okay, normally. But the mutation, which came in about 7,500 years ago, sits here which then prevents that protein from shutting off um, from shutting off lactase. Okay, so it means that people with that mutation can drink milk as adults. The, the ability to drink milk as adults is the mutation. 85 to 90% of white Northern European Caucasians, Dutch, Danish, British people um, can drink milk. Every single one of you has exactly that same mutation that appeared 7,500 years ago. That is my interesting fact. That is a cool fact. Uh, yeah, I'm a mutant, I, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Maybe one of the first things that I was wondering in general, so a lot of people are talking about calories, we count calories, but there's a big difference between 100 calories of protein and 100 calories or of sugar or fat. And what is the difference like for our bodies and why do they not provide the same amount of energy? Okay, I think there are two different reasons. Um, there is because of differences in digestion of our, of the, so digestion is when clearly, uh, uh, when we break the foods that we eat into nutrients that are then go across the gut wall. So that's the first thing and metabolism. Now let's start with the digestion first digestion. We eat, everything goes down. Um, and it just takes longer to digest protein. Okay. So if, so if you actually take a, a, a amount of protein, it is the most complex to break down digestion wise. And so it takes a little bit more energy and it takes a little bit longer. And actually it ends up making you feel a little bit fuller as well, which is why protein is more satiating, but that's not where the key thing lies. Where the key thing lies is if you take at, um, if you look once when you eat carbohydrates, they become sugars. When you eat fat, they become triglycerides, fatty acids. And when you eat uh, protein, they become amino acids. Now, if you actually look at carbs, sugar, and fat, they're only ever made of three types of atoms, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. That's it in different configurations, but only those three uh, um, atoms. And so it's actually quite efficient to deal with carbohydrates and fat 
because your body is just taking the same uh, um, atoms and moving it around, okay, chemically. The problem with protein is that it also, in addition to carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, it also contains nitrogen, okay, and a little few other things, but primarily nitrogen. Now, there is no um, inert store of protein in your body. What do I mean by this? All protein in your body is active. Okay, are you either building something or you're repairing something. Whereas obviously fat can be stored as fat and carbohydrates can be stored as glycogen. Okay, whereas protein has to be used. If it's not used, it's stored as fat. In order to store protein, you then need to take out the nitrogen and we and it comes out as uric as urea, uric acid, we then weed it out, okay? And that whole process of stripping the nitrogen out of protein um, costs energy, which is why for every 100 calories of protein that we eat, it takes 30 calories in energy. 30% of the calories of the energy we eat in protein is spent dealing with protein, removing the, um, removing the, uh, the nitrogen, moving it about, and actually just doing general things, general things to it. Um, it is less efficient to deal with protein. We give the 30% off as heat. It's called diet-induced thermogenesis. Um, so protein calories are 30% wrong everywhere. And this is not accounted for in any of the food uh, la labeling systems um, out there. There we go. That's why. In your book, you also talk about calorie counting and why maybe, yeah, it's not that efficient. One of the things also is, for example, you mentioned I was on the diary of a CEO that you mentioned, like a celery stick is six calories. When you boil it, it's 30 calories. Why is that? Because that that would actually make calorie counting inefficient. It doesn't matter at all if it makes such a big difference. You're absolutely right. And so look, I am not anti-physics. I want to I want to put out, we haven't added any energy to the celery by cooking it. That is not what has happened. Okay. We're not, we're not fusing things together. You're not um, this creating is down, energy out of it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'm yeah. not countermanding, you know, laws of physics. <laughs> so what what this is down to is how many calories are stuck in a food, any kind of food, versus how many calories we can get out of the food. I think the most um extreme we'll get to the we'll get to the celery in a second, but I think the most extreme example, which I've I've used any number of times, is sweet corn, corn on the cob. Okay. So when you eat corn, say you eat 100 calories, let's go with 100 calories of corn. And then you next morning, you kind of, you, you look in the loo, uh, um, clearly you haven't absorbed 100 calories of sweet corn. Okay, so that's a, that's a very classic example. However, if you take sweet corn and you dry it, you desiccate it, you pound it and make it into a corn meal or corn starch or corn flour, and you use that to make corn bread, you use it to make a corn tortilla, whatever you want to do with it. Suddenly, you get a lot more calories out of exactly the same food. We haven't added calories. It's just that the act of processing the food breaks down. It's, it always acts like an external stomach. Okay, so you, what your body would normally do, your stomach juices and digestive uh, um, effects to try and take it apart, um, there's not long enough in our body for it to digest and it's packed full of fiber. And so the whole process of... Um, of either processing the corn or in the, in the case of celery, cooking the celery acts as an external stomach. It, it sort of does some of the digestion for you so that when you eat it, our body can then extract more calories. This, I mean, this is true about cooking in general. So, so when people, because that's what cooking does, right? So cooking starts the digestive process so that you get more calories for every given amount of work you've taken to track down the, the venison, to track down the deer, okay? Before we used, to, we used to eat it raw, we have to chew it and everything like that. But the moment we began to control fire, okay? So people have actually put this together. The moment we began to control fire and could then cook our food, that is when our brains begin to grow. Why? Because then we didn't have to, we expended the same amount of energy because we still have to chase the antelope down or pluck the turnip from the from the ground, whatever it is. But because we could cook it, we could get more calories out. We could relax a bit more, you know, and then, then agriculture happened. That happened later as well. But so cooking, processing um, makes it easier for our body to get the calories out. That is why when you take a stick of celery, uh, it's six calories raw, 
Whereas if you cook it, you break down some of the fibers in a stew or something, then you actually get five times the number of calories just by cooking it. And so on the packaging that we see in the store, it's like based on the raw materials, not on the processed materials. That's correct. That's, that's yeah. absolutely right. The thing about the packaging is that then we have to do a little, a, a, little bit, a little bit of history. So the packaging takes into account the fiber element to it, but it doesn't take into account the cooking element to it. So in other words, it takes into account some of the fiber and celery because the cooking hasn't removed the fiber. It's just made our body easier to actually get, get, get into it. So it doesn't take into account the, the vagaries of that. It does take into account what comes out the other side. There, there was a guy called, um, and I write about it, um, in the book. And once again, I did not invent any of this. I just want to be be clear. Okay. Is this is this is all work that was done. So the, the calorie counts on the side of the packet today um actually emerged from a chap called uh, Professor Olin uh, Wilbur Olin Atwater, who was a professor of chemistry um in uh, Connecticut, United States, uh between 1880 and 1900. So a long time ago. Okay, hundred more than 120, 140 years ago. And what he did was he spent a sabbatical in Germany, and Germany uh, in, in the mid 1800s um, actually pioneered the use of calorimetry, bomb calorimetry, where you burn the food and, and measure the amount of heat up in order in agriculture. Okay, so if you're raising a cow, you want to know how much feed you actually give the cow, how much milk you get, how much meat you get. So farmers were always very, very, very uh, um, uh, interested. Um, in terms of how much to feed the cow in order to get a good cow or pig or what have you. And so he spent a sabbatical and then he took this research back to the United States and began to think, hmm, if we could do it with cows, couldn't we do this with the human food? What kind of food were we actually, were we actually having? So he understood the sweet corn concept I just des described to you. So he understood that actually we weren't absorbing everything that we were eating. So what he did between 1880 and 1900, after he came back from Germany, he then burnt a lot of food and measured how much heat was given off in like something called a bomb calorimeter. Okay, so this is, this is what he learned in Germany. And then what he did was he then fed, so he did it with carrots, celery, steak, whatever, all kinds of food. He then fed the food to human beings and then he burnt the human poop. So he, he understood what went in. He understood what came out. He subtracted one from the other. He then worked out how much protein, um, you know, uh, carbs, fat there was in there. And he was the one that came up with the famous numbers that all of us learned in school, where four calories for every gram of protein, four calories for every gram of carb, and nine calories for, for a gram of uh, fat. And these are called the at-water factors. And all the calorie counts that we actually um, see on the side of the pack come from those nine, four, four numbers. And, and every single one of them. There's a little bit of wobble. I know you people listening are now going to go back and, and open up their closets to find the cabinets to actually find the calorie counts. There is a little bit of wobble. The numbers are not exact because each company uh, works in different ways to calculate how much protein there are, uh, um, there is in food. They typically calculate the amount of nitrogen. And so that's the wobble factor. But every calorie count takes is is at waters uh, is at based on at waters numbers. He took into account digestion, so the, the the sweet corn factor. He didn't take into account the metabolism element of it, the fact that it takes amount of energy to. So at waters numbers were right at the time to a certain amount, but it didn't take into account the energy used in metabolizing the actual nutrients. You said that in in his measurements, he took fiber into account. Now fiber is something important. But what is fiber and why is it good for us? So fiber is important for a number of different reasons. It's okay. Biologically, first of all, it is very, very important for our gut microbiome, the, the, the bacteria that live in our guts, because some it, if it keeps you regular, okay, like eating prunes. So there you go. Uh, it keeps your bugs happy. Okay. They they survive, they thrive in the actual in the actual fiber. So it's actually important for just your overall um, health. If you didn't eat fiber, you would, you would know about it. It'd be, it'd be terrible. You'd feel, you'd feel ill. So that's the first thing. But in addition to that, however, there are additional benefits to actually having fiber. Now, fiber comes exclusively from plants, as you know, you're a plant as, a, as a plant scientist. Um, and so what fiber also does is to slow down um, the release of the sugars found in 
fruit and vegetables. Let the, the, the example, the clearest example to take is orange juice, which obviously comes from an orange. Now you can take exactly the same food, either juiced into a glass or eating the orange. Now, the thing about um, drinking the orange juice, which is, look, it's fine. I'm not an anti-orange. Well, actually, I am anti-orange juice. The reason it's because from a sugar perspective, there is as much sugar in orange juice as there is in Coca-Cola. I'm not kidding you. Around 11% okay, of, of it is, is going to be sugar. And it's not better sugar because it's natural for you. It's it's still sugar, okay? Now, undoubtedly, orange juice probably has more vitamin C and maybe has an improved profile in minerals. Yes, there are benefits to drinking orange juice. But if you actually focus on the sugar, it's exactly the same as Coca-Cola. Now, so when you drink it, there is no digestion. It goes into your, to, to your stomach. The moment it hits your small intestine, the glucose is just absorbed within the first foot of your of your gut if anything like that because there's no there's no digestion now the difference between eating an orange so therefore your glucose levels go up relatively quickly and come down relatively quickly if you're not diabetic okay now the thing about eating an orange a number of different things first you chew it and so when you're chewing your body then senses is chewing and it begins to say, oh, some you're eating now. We need to prepare yourself for calories. I'm, I'm, I'm going to prepare yourself. So that's the first thing. Okay. Secondly, as the lump of food that comes and makes it in, your body has to work harder in order to extract, because of the fiber, to extract the sugars from the fiber. And so even though it eventually extracts all the sugar, it takes a longer time to do that. So you have a different glucose profile, your blood, blood sugar profile, by eating an orange versus drinking the juice. And finally... There is a general rule when we come to think about food science. Foods that take longer to digest make you feel fuller, okay? Because it travels further down the gut, different gut hormones are released, and these gut hormones tend to make you feel fuller. And so clearly, as I said, with the orange juice, you drink it, that's it, it's gone. So there's no fullness at all. And so on top of everything else that I've just said, if you actually eat the orange, it goes down, it has the effect of making you feel slightly fuller. And so if you take all of that into account, first of all, fiber is good for you. But even if you just eat it, it does different things to your blood sugar. It takes longer to digest, so it makes you feel fuller. And so eating an orange will make you feel a little bit fuller through the day compared if you just drank the orange juice. So that, I think, is the importance of fiber. Yeah, so you absorb also less calories when, when there's fiber involved? Or, or it just takes longer? So... It depends. Clearly, it really depends on what you're eating. An orange, we can extract all of it. Now, if we ate some, let's take the extreme. If we ate grass, we don't. Obviously, it makes us feel ill. But the extreme, okay, take, taking some to an extreme or straw or something like that. Um, we cannot, uh, that will come right out, as you know. Whereas a cow um, obviously has a rumen. It needs to ferment the fiber in order to get the energy. So... For some, fight, like in fruit that we eat, and the reason why we eat it is we can get the energy from it. It just takes a little while longer. Whereas other vegetables, uh, we can't we can't extract um, at all, uh, really, or very, very, or very, very little. So it really is food specific, plant specific, what we're talking about. And also, a bit the interacting of the different molecules that are in the food. For um, so it's different when you eat one hundred calories of sugar, or if you combine that sugar with fat and carbohydrates, I mean, we eat food, we don't eat elements. Exactly. What, what, yeah. So what is the difference for our bodies? So I, so what I actually did, um, uh, I turned 50 this year and I cycled, uh, that's a, thank you. Thank you. No. And I, and, and in lieu of buying a Porsche, okay. I, I, I cycled from, I cycled the length of the UK. Way better than a Porsche. <laughs> It's called the Lands and the John O'Groats Ride. So it's 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 it was a thousand miles. What's that? One thousand six hundred kilometers, which I did over uh, two weeks. So it was roughly it was seventy five miles a day. Whatever. What is that? One hundred and ten, hundred and twenty kilometers a day cycling for for two weeks. Look, I'm not. I didn't race it. I I, I cycled to finish it. But what I did do was I did it with two glucose monitors. You know these continuous blood glucose monitors that diabetics use, but increasingly. Um, people are using it as a health tool, okay? Now, we can debate how useful it is as a health tool, but what it does do 
is it gives you continuous blood glucose. This is this this is or at least a a, um, a proxy of, of blood glucose, which is on your phone, and so you can look at it. And so you could see what happened to it as you were eating. Now, here a couple of interesting things about not only about the interaction of the food. Now, if I ate, unsurprisingly, if I ate a chocolate bar, okay, um, in isolate or an energy bar, so I was cycling, so an energy an energy bar, um, in isolation, but not exercising. If I'm exercising, your blood glucose levels don't, your your muscles are opened up and absorbing all the sugar, so nothing really happens to it. But if I was sat down in a hotel room and eating it in isolation, my blood glucose levels spiked. No surprise. But if I ate it as a dessert, which means that I had um, a meal of whatever I, whatever your meal happened to be, a, a main meal, and then I had some chocolatey dessert thing or a chocolate bar for dessert, then the, actually my blood glucose levels did not spike. And so clearly in now, here is my issue with using these blood glucose monitors as a tool for how healthy a food is. Does it, does making, does the chocolate bar, once again, I'm not, is it more or less healthy because of what happens to its sugar? Okay. Or is it more or less healthy because I ate it alone versus eating it after a meal? I think there's something more nuanced here. The glucose levels clearly something happens. So the interaction of the food changes how your glucose interacts. So that is what I think we need to get from it rather than saying the chocolate bar is healthy or not. Or not healthy. The other example is if you take uh, a boiled potato, just peel off the skin. In particular, you peel off the skin, and you just eat the boiled potato. Um, your your sugar levels will also spike. Okay, because particularly if you take out the fiber, you peel the potato. Now, if however, you take the potato and you fry it, frit, you make it into a French fry. Suddenly, your blood glucose levels do not go up as high. Now, nobody is trying to tell anybody that a boiled potato is less healthy for you than a fried potato. But if you take just the glucose in isolation, fat acts like, a, acts like the fiber. It slows down the release of the sugars within, that, within the potato. Okay, this is actually happens in, in a number of other plants, uh, plants as well. So yes, the interaction, how you cook it, how you prepare it does make a difference in how your body extracts the sugar. It doesn't make, in isolation, just the glucose levels, I think is not particularly useful about how healthy something is. I think you do need to take a look at the context, fat content, sugar content, salt content. But yes, in interaction, your body does different things with the sugar, um, fat, fiber, order of which you actually eat the food. So for your blood sugar levels, it's actually better to combine fat and carbohydrates, but is it also yeah, healthier? I, I don't know if healthier is the right word, but what, what, what would you prefer to eat? What, what would be the best option? Eat it separate or combine the food? Do you know something? I asked, so I am not a di I, I study obesity, uh, but I'm not a clinician. Okay. And I study type two diabetes. So I asked my endocrine, my diabetologist friends, my friends who see diabetic patients, and I asked them this question. I says, okay, in someone with no diabetes, now undoubtedly, if you have diabetes, either type one or type two, any of this is bad for you. And so you will want to avoid it. Okay. And these monitors are designed exactly for that. They're designed to take as a diabetic to actually take the one number that really, really matters to you so you can control it. Now, the question is, what happens in a normal glucose human being, okay? I don't know if you're diabetic, but I'm not diabetic, okay? And so I asked them, well, okay, a number of them. I says, well, is there any, what is the evidence that the spikes in a healthy person, um, the area under the curve, shall we say, okay, the spikes, does it matter to your future health? Okay, and and what my colleagues tell me is, do you know what we don't know, and we don't know because there hasn't been large enough studies done to ask the question because no one needs you have to observe, um, uh, uh, what the spikiness of your food is, your diet is, um, vis a vis the amount of fiber you have, what have you, and then look a, a few years down the line enough to actually say, in a large enough population to say, people with less spiky blood when they were uh, healthier are less likely to be unhealthy later. 
So we the answer is we don't know. Now, uh, I think we are probably in a position to begin to ask that question. I don't know if you have one of the big um, purveyors of these uh, blood glucose monitors is a company called Zoe. I don't know if Zoe app exists um, um, in, in mainland Europe, but a number of these apps exist, okay, where, where, they, where they measure your blood glucose levels and try to make some prediction to, to your health. So because many more people are now using it, okay, I think there is the opportunity to to do to do science on it. What is interesting? I'm a cycling cycling fan, as 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 you know, and I I like to road cycling. I like to watch Tour de France, for example, the Vuelta. Um, it's interesting that I think it was now five years back or something like that. But it must have been about that. Chris Froome, who's obviously a British British cyclist at this time, I think it was Team Sky. I don't think it was Ineos yet. Anyway, so he was racing, and this was in the Giro, okay, in the Tour of Italy. And he was using a, and this was one of the days he attacked uh, from quite far out, and then he won. He he won the stage and actually nearly won the Giro as well. And he was doing it with a blood glucose monitor, and were very very carefully titrating the amount of whatever the hell they eat, okay, uh, into him, so that the grams of glucose, and so they were actually managing his glucose monitoring. Okay, this was what they did. You know, Team Sky or Ineos do a lot of these sciencey stuff. What is interesting is that after this occasion and at the end of the season, the International Cycling Federation banned the use of blood glucose monitoring. So now it's not allowed in a peloton. So a professional cyclist can use it for training. You can use it for training. You can, whatever you're doing, but you cannot use it in a race, which which to me was a little bit surprising. Now, once again, you, you do what you do, but we all wear heart rate monitors. You know, it's cheap or step counting. Um, we certainly measured a power output output when we actually cycle. I'm a little bit surprised about the anti-science movement. It's cheap. It's not like it's a really super expensive thing. I'm not sure why they banned it, but they have banned it. So if you, you look it up, they banned it from the professional peloton. They're not allowed to use blood glucose monitors um, um, in, in cycling competitions. Yeah, that's weird because it, it doesn't feel like cheating or anything. It's just doing the science. It's just, do, it's just doing the science. And it's not like it's so expensive, right? That only the 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 most rich teams can do it, and they're trying to because that's not the case because it's cheap. Okay, everyone can do it. You know, there are normal people wandering around with it. Every team has a power monitors. I can guarantee you that they know the number of watts they're actually giving on their bike. That is far more expensive. So I I don't know. It smells a bit anti science to me. Uh, I, I think the whole thing. I think I I do think that where heart rate monitors are used. Um, you know, people are obviously looking uh, for for drug cheats and this and that. I think it's part of the science. I think these measurements, to my mind, should be able to be used, particularly for healthy people sitting around on my, on my backside and in, in, in the house. I don't know how useful it is, but as an Olymp as an ath elite athlete, when you are actually fine tuning your your carbohydrate, I don't see why that's cheating. I don't. I don't think it is. Well, actually, here we're pro science, so. We'll stay on the science. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, we talked about nutrition, but if you eat too much, you obviously store it as fat. Now, the amount of fat cells actually doesn't change that much over your yeah over a long time. I have multiple questions about that, actually. Why is that? And also, like every seven years or so, all your cells in your body are renewed. Why are the fat cells not reduced? For example, if you stay skinny, why are they not then reduced, even if all your cells are renewed? Okay, this is a very interesting question. I clearly your fat cell numbers can change over time. Okay, and this is this this is good. That obviously can happen, and it also depends on where you are in your stage in in your stage in life. What that statement about the fact that your fat cells don't change that much. I'm talking about a relatively healthy human being sat there over a few years as adults, clearly as babies. Okay. So this is this is the very specific time. So as an adult, when you're trying to when you gain weight or lose weight, you don't gain fat cells or lose fat cells. They act like balloons. They get bigger and they get smaller. Now there are a number of different cases in which you will change fat cell numbers. You can get a fat cancer. Okay. And you will then you will then end up, and that's not great for you either. You can get lipid. Deep. There are a number of different conditions that will happen when you're growing rapidly. Um, you do put down fat cells um, as well. So there are cases where your fat cells will clearly change. 
But in a situation of a even over a few years from, you know, over the past 10 years, my fat cells may have renewed, but they would roughly have stayed the, 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 the same. It's same with your muscle cells, okay? Where, where, where your muscle cells, broadly speaking, stay the same number of muscle cells. When you're building your muscles, they get bigger. You get more monthly nuclear, they're bigger. You don't actually, you don't actually get that much more muscle cells as well. It's the same, it's the same, uh, it's the same kind, kind of thing. Over your lifetime, yes, of course they do, of course they do, they, they, they do change. Now, why this is important, clearly, is, is in why is being fat, why is carrying too much fat? bad for you and, and this ultimately the, the institute um that i work at the um the mrc metabolic diseases unit which is where um, i'm here in cambridge it's a government funded unit to to actually look at obesity and what we do is we study we the whole the whole unit studies the causes and consequences of obesity of carrying too much fat now i am the cause side i i do food intake but a lot of my colleagues study well what happens when you actually end up get, getting too fat Okay, and you end up with metabolic disease, broadly speaking, and a large, big, a, a huge reason for it is because the safest place to store fat is is in fat, because it's your professional fat storing organ. But at some point, the fat cells will become full. Okay, they get to the point, and they won't take any more fat. And when all your fat cells are full, then the fat has to go somewhere else, and it ends up in your muscles, in your liver, in your in organs not designed to store large amounts of fat, and that is when you become ill. That's when you end up with liver disease or heart disease or, or diabetes, okay? It depends on what disease you end up with, depends on who you are, depends on your genes. But broadly speaking, if you have too much fat that goes into those organs, bad things happen. And so the question, therefore, is, well, how much fat is too much fat? And there, once again, it's also down to our genes because there are people, myself included, East Asian people, um, South Asian people, Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, for example, um, who cannot gain as much weight as white people, as Polynesians, before becoming increasing risk of actually getting diabetes. And that's because we store less fat safely than some other than some other ethnicities. And all of this is down to not only not only the expandability of fat, how how stretchy these but fat balloons are. Okay, this obviously then influences how much fat you can store but also where you store the fat famously around your tummy versus around your bum and that also makes a very very big uh difference into into why being fat why carrying too much fat is actually is actually bad for you and so it especially gets or becomes a problem when it gets around your organs actually but interestingly it's not because they're next to your organs that is generally the problem so people think it's because they bring the fat closer to the organs, and that is an issue. It's actually a different type of fat. Uh, uh, um, so it secretes different, I mean, it's fat, it, 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 it has a balloon, but it secretes different types of hormones. So now how do we know this? Now, this is work that was done in mice rather than actually done in human beings. But what they did was they took a mouse, they got the mouse fat, um, and they then took the fat around the organs, the visceral fat, took it out of one mouse, and transplanted it onto another mouse. And it didn't matter where they put it. Okay, they put it on the backside, they put it on the back, um, or they put it next, they kind of like stuck it next, next to the organ. It was the presence of the fat in the mouse that then caused, I don't know if the mouse became ill, but they measured, you know, the hormone levels and things like that. They, they then made the mouse ill, quote unquote. So, the fat around the organs just happens to be a different type of fat um, rather than it necessarily being geographically next to the organs that make it actually bad for you um, um, for that. Now, that you might think, well, why the hell would we have this fat? What, what, what's the advantage to this fat? Okay, so this fat, however, around the organs, this so-called visceral fat, compared to the subcutaneous fat, fat underneath the skin and around your bum, um, is more available to you when you exercise. So when you exercise, okay, that fat is more easily accessible and released compared to, compared to the fat around your bum. That takes longer to actually do. So in other words, if you had a big, and it's tend to, it tends to be 
it's not exclusive, but it tends to be men that store the fat around the organ areas, right? Women tend to look like pears. Men famously are shaped like apples. Not exclusively, because obviously we have we know examples of both. But if you were a beer belly guy, okay, and actually decided to exercise, you would lose, you know, and you have these skinny legs. You know, you, you know what I mean. You get skinny legs, skinny bum, but then it's big. Uh, actually, when you exercise, you will lose, uh, uh, you will lose the beer belly faster than if you had a big bum and tried to do it. So I think the reason this exists. Okay, in men, you can do all kinds of anthropological reasons why, but let's assume, okay, let's assume that in most societies, men were, were you know, if we were, that men were doing the hunting or what have you, okay, and perhaps there needed to be a ready, ready source of fuel that you could use if you were, if you were chasing something. Once again, we can't prove this, but let's just think about this. Um, and so, therefore, the issue is not having the fat. This fat that's around your organs, the issue is obviously with the environment we have today is carrying too much of the fat. And it just so happens that the hormones it secretes, if you have too much of it, is particularly bad, particularly bad for you. So so it's it's not because it's adjacent to the organs, it's a different type of fat. Well, this actually brings us very close to your work, I think. Why is it so difficult for some people to say no to food, even if they have enough of energy in store, let's say? So... As I said, and I, I've established, I'm not anti-physics. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so if you go back to the fundamental laws, clearly, and we need to state this. Um, if you don't think about it as clearly, I work on this. Um, you you have to eat too much to gain weight, and the only way, or at least eat more than you burn, and therefore the only way to lose weight is you need to burn more than you eat or eat less. Okay. Primarily is the eating element that, to, to it, but it's physics, and so. Where therefore are the genes? Wait a minute, isn't it is isn't this just a fundamental law of physics physics scenario? So where, but that is the how how we get to the body weight we are is a function of physics because it's a law, but the question is the why, and so now we know, okay, that some people feel because of genes within their brain primarily, um, that people are more driven towards food for a number of different reasons, okay, uh, uh, and and they mix. So for example, some people can feel hungrier all the time. Some people take more food to get full up. Some people um, have a more uh, responsive reward element in their brain, hedonic part of the region. And when it comes to eating, so in other words, they comfort eat because, because they eat, it makes them feel nicer. Okay. Other people use food as fuel and, you know, the weird people, <laughs> they, don't, they don't necessarily, <laughs> but, but all these are different behaviors. Okay. And they're not mutually exclusive. Clearly you can you can be a comfort eater, stress eater, and also feel hungry or, or what have you. Um, and so all of these genes, however, the, the, the unifying element to these genes is they all function largely within the brain because the brain controls your feeling towards food. People started to think, is it fat? Is it your stomach? They play a big role. But the actual sensing of how hungry you are and the actual action of it happens within the brain. So because some people, because of their genes, find it more difficult to say no to food, feel hungrier, need to eat more to get to 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 be as to be as full, are more uh, likely to turn to food when they are depressed, for example. Okay, um, that's the reason why when you look at those genes, why some people are larger than 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 other people because they they eat more because of their behavior around food, and so therefore are small, medium, or large. And can that change during your lifetime? Because I, I, it it might, also, might sound weird, but like when I was a child, I didn't like food that much. It was like you eat because your parents tell you you have to eat. Now I love food <laughs> and it's really hard to say no. Like I'm also a stress eater and stuff like that. Um, so that clearly has shifted some way. So, so what is happening there? Okay. That is a complex question. Okay. Because you're, you're absolutely right. So for some people, so we just let me give you give you an example two two examples if I if I may let's deal with the most obvious one first okay a lot of it can be down to your hormones and the most classic example is look we're both male men and so therefore our <laughs> after puberty our male hormones are relatively stable and then your testosterone kind of goes down after a bit of time women however obviously are marked by a number of really drastic shifts to their hormone levels after puberty, leaving aside puberty. Um, you, you have a woman pre-pregnancy, you have a pregnant woman, you have a woman post-pregnancy, you have a woman menopause. 
all of which are marked by huge changes in hormones and their body shape and their, how they eat and how they behave and how they deal with food changes dramatically, even though they're the same human being, just older. Okay. And so your hormone levels make play a big role. This is less likely in men, but once again, it will also happen in men. So that's the first thing. Your sex hormones do, do change. Then there are childhood and adult onset uh, um, obesity genes. So we just have a paper in, um, in press. So it just it got accepted just last month in which we uh, found a new, quote unquote, new obesity gene. We found a new gene that, um, uh, that when mutated, relatively rarely, but not that, not that rare, uh, caused a difference in BMI of nearly four BMI points. Okay, it's a lot, it's a lot of weight. Okay, we're, lo we're probably looking something like, you know, you know, 10 kilos difference, 15. It's a lot, it's a lot of weight difference. What was interesting is that it marked adult obesity rather than childhood obesity. So there's some genes that we find that are linked to childhood obesity, which means that um, particularly within the fat sensing pathway, how much fat you have actually eaten, if you have mutations or changes in those genes, kids you tend to end up with early onset weight gain. So in other words, they get you, you end up with kids with obesity. And the moment you have an overweight, a kid with overweight or obesity, they tend to stay overweight as obesity as adults as well, tend. Now, there are then other genes, which we're still trying to work out why, okay, which are not associated with childhood obesity at all. I don't know if it's you necessarily, you know, because you don't look uh, um, like you've got extra weight, but... What that happens is this is only associated with ad uh, uh, obesity post-puberty into, into adulthood. We're still trying to work out why this, why it happens. It's possible that it interacts a bit with the hormones because your hormones clearly change between childhood and adulthood. That is the one big changer. Um, and so maybe it requires adult uh, a repertoire of hormones to for the gene to express itself. It could be degeneration. I'm not talking like like people being suddenly having Alzheimer's, but imagine that because we're all, after all, biological machines, things keep working, and at some point they um, they don't break down. But let's let's like a car odometer, right? You 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 have miles on the clock uh, uh, that that actually keep going. Now, is there something about this particular gene we're looking we're, we're looking at where suddenly because you have a mutation in it, it accelerates this? Okay, this degenerative "quote unquote" process. So the, the answer is we don't know, but undoubtedly, this new gene we found is associated with adult obesity rather than childhood obesity. So I do think it doesn't change your gene. Your genes don't change in life, but there are things that do change: your hormone levels, how much you eat. You know, your environment does change, and I think that actually changes the expression of this particular gene. So yes. Uh, uh, there are childhood obesity, adult obesity. Blah, blah, blah. There are a number of different things to study, and it's a hot topic, hot topic of uh, of, of research at the moment. It's a shame I I'm, haven't been able to read the paper yet because it has been just accepted. Hasn't been out Congratulations, yet. <laughs> congratulations! You. But I have a, a short commentary that you wrote here as well. Is calorie labeling on menus the solution to obesity? Maybe in short, can you tell us a bit more? And is it a solution? Does it work? Okay, if you look at the pure numbers, so uh, the the best numbers came, and the, the UK is coming up slightly behind. The best numbers probably come from the United States around the Obama time. Um, he then, healthcare changes, ended up putting uh, calorie numbers on a number of different big shop, uh, big um, food purveyors. They were probably three or four years ahead of the UK, and then we then obviously. Uh, put it in uh, in the UK in April two years ago. I don't know what happens in Europe, but we know the numbers now. And so, roughly speaking, if you take a because you got to you got to make the comparison correct, okay. So if you actually take a major fast food or major restaurant chain, pre labeling and post labeling, what they have found, and people went and you got to do the sums, um, is that post labeling certainly up to two years after the labeling happened. People were buying per transaction 4% plus or minus less calories per transaction. Now, this was at the two-year mark. There, there is a decay. So in other words, it was effective and, and, then, and then it became slightly less effective over time. 
So over the kind of two year period of time, you're probably looking within a calorie counting, very, very fixed calorie counting scenario of maybe an effects of, of, of having 4% less calories. Now this is not nothing. It does make a difference. If you had 4% less calories every single day, it makes, it makes a difference. But there are two things here to actually think about. First of all, how long does it last? And this will only happen with time uh, in, in which we then get we then get an answer. That's the first thing. The second is, have you actually improved the diet of the person at all? Because now we're just looking at the pure calories. And the problem with calories, first of all, they're wrong. I just established why, or at least they're a little bit wrong. Um, but there are blind, the calorie doesn't, it. Uh, uh, if you take 200 calories of potatoes, it's twice the amount of potatoes as 100 calories of potatoes. But so is 200 grams of potatoes twice 100 grams of potatoes. It doesn't tell you anything. It tells you about the amount of food you're eating. It doesn't tell you about the quality, the nutritional content of the food. It doesn't tell you how much fat, fiber, minerals, vitamins. So the reason why it does give you some information about the amount of food you're eating, and that clearly is important to a degree, obviously. But I just get the feeling that for a large sector of the world population, it is the quality of the food that's the problem rather than necessarily purely the amount of food. For some people, it is the amount of the food. I grant you that. But on a global level, geopolitically, okay, the issue is the quality of food, uh, uh, to, to, to my mind. And calorie counts give you nothing, no information at all about the quality of the food that you're having. And I, and I think it's more important to think it's certainly as important to think about the quality of the food that we're eating and feeding our children in particular. Um, and I don't think calorie counts are the way to go here. That also brings us actually to, yeah, like you said, the quality of the food to ultra processed foods. What are ultra processed foods? And also there has been like, if I'm not mistaken, for an example, our sodas. If I'm not mistaken, you can gain weight from low calorie sodas like Coke Zero and stuff like that. You can still gain weight. So there's like ultra processed foods and low calories, but it's all, all a weird mix. Let me deal with the low calorie ones first. The low calorie observation. Now, once again, we cannot be anti-physics, okay? And if you drank the low calorie drink by itself versus Coca-Cola, full fat, whatever, Pepsi, other drinks are available, um, by itself and compare the two. Clearly, you're not going to gain any weight from the low calorie drink versus something with sugar in it. That so, if people do gain weight, and you're absolutely right, there is there is a link there between that. Then what is it? Now, is it a situation where you're picking a lifestyle? Okay, where uh, this is the classic causation correlation story, right? So in other words, if you were drinking, now I I happen to prefer diet drinks because I prefer the flavor, but that is neither here nor there. But if you take a, a large person, is the person on a diet anyway? In other words, are they likely to be heavier? That's why they're drinking the diet soda. Option one. Option two, does eating, does drinking the diet soda uh, make you think that you are, that you can eat more elsewhere? Whether or not you think or whether or not your body biologically responds to eating more elsewhere, that is another thing in time. So that's the, I think the soda, I think that is a very complex, it's a very complex interaction that needs that belies the headlines, I think it needs to be looked at a little bit further. Okay, now ultra-processed foods. What is an ultra-processed food? I want to draw a distinction, a, a very, very important distinction between ultra-processed foods and processed foods. Because I think almost everything we eat is processed to, in some degree, except maybe if you walked into your garden and plucked an apple off a tree. Okay, so that's not processed. because, because But anything else you do, if you cook it, if you pickle it, if you dry it, if you, whatever the hell you do to it, ferment it, okay, it is a process. And there's nothing wrong with that because it's kept us alive. We've we discussed this. It increased the, the amounts of calories we have. Ultra processing, however, is an industrialized processing, um, industrialized processes that we cannot replicate within our kitchen, okay? Or within most restaurants that actually cook food in the, in the, in the back, we, we can't do it. So it's an industrialized process. So I guess, uh, uh, so that's the difference between ultra processed and processed. So what is the, is, is doing the rounds? Everyone is talking about ultra processed foods at the moment. What is the problem with ultra processed foods? Okay. Now the issue with ultra, now I am not a food Nazi. 
Okay, I do it. Sometimes I want a chocolate bar. Sometimes you don't want. But what is the problem with it? So inherently, when you ultra process something, you remove protein and or fiber, depending on what food item you're talking about, because of the processing. Okay, so ultra processed foods are inherently lower in protein and lower in fiber. So therefore, they are more um, cal calorically available. And because they're so processed, 100 calories of an ultra processed foods is pretty close to 100 calories total because it's been so processed, we absorb all the calories. So problem number one. Problem number two, ultra processed foods also lack flavor. Okay, now where does flavor come from? Flavor comes from the holy trinity of sugar, salt, and fat. Okay, so if you actually take out sugar, salt, and there's no flavor. You have to add in the flavor. So you add in sugar, salt, and fat. So ultra processed foods tend to be low in protein and fiber and high in sugar, salt, and fat. And so if you look at it in that way, we, we need to eat a little bit less of it. Okay. And I think some foods probably stay away from. The problem with the term ultra processed is it is not precise. Okay. This is my argument. Some people disagree with me, but I don't think it's very precise. Okay. Now there are some foods that we eat out there which I think are uncontroversial in terms of being ultra processed and we should probably eat not a lot of it, okay? And I think we can imagine what some of these foods are. But more than around half of the ultra processed calories that we certainly in, um, uh, uh, in the higher income countries eat come from bread or pastry, okay? Now, here's the, my issue. Bread, largely speaking, is flour, salt, water, and some yeast from somewhere. Blood. Okay. Now, yes, in supermarket bread, you add a bit of emulsifiers. Maybe you put in some vitamin C, right, to help it rise, but whatever. There are a number of different things. So I just have a problem. Now, clearly, you can go buy nice sourdough, you know, bougie bread from your favorite bakery, and it tastes better. It does taste better. That is not my point. All right. But say you're poor and can't afford expensive bread and you go buy the cheap bread. It doesn't taste as nice, but is it worse for you as an ultra processed nature because it's been processed in that fashion? I find that very, very difficult to believe compared to getting a nugget, a chicken nugget, quote unquote, which is so far removed from a chicken. I, I Okay. That's a very different scenario. Whereas if you're dealing with flour, water, salt, yeast, I've, it's too broad a church. It, another example, if you have yogurt, yogurt, okay? And it doesn't matter if you have the Greek flavored, fancy schmancy yogurt that is completely plain, or if you get yogurts, we all have the, you know, the square yogurts on one corner, you can dip the stuff in. Okay, so the yogurt in itself is not an ultra process. It's, it's a yogurt. The jam or the little chocolate balls that you put in suddenly are ultra processed. So you're telling me that because I put in the chocolate balls into the thing, then the entire dish becomes ultra processed. My worry about ultra process is it's it's it. I think we need to be more precise in the way we speak about food in the nutritional content of the food. And I think ultra process is not helpful enough because it's not precise enough. But anyway, so that, that was a very long answer. I very apologize for that. But that is my view on ultra processed foods. I think it's too blunt a tool. I think it needs to be more precise in the way we think about um, and what, what we eat so that we don't remove foods that are actually perfectly safe from you from the food chain. Does it mean that it tastes nicer? No. I think I think the best food probably tastes nice when you cook a piece of steak or you cook vegetables. It probably does taste nice uh, uh, like that. But there are a lot of poor people in the country and in, in the world who need food. Should they suddenly have the food banned from them because because it's cheaper from them? I don't I don't think so. I think that's being snobby about about the foods that we eat. Yeah. So actually, ultra processed food is maybe too broad a term. We need to have maybe different types of ultra processed I so. food. I think so. I think so. Rather than the concept of it. I mean, clearly we need to eat less of some foods. I, I'm not denying that whatsoever. You know, sodas, thingy, the best thing to drink probably is water. I, I like a soda, but the best, the reality is the best thing to drink is probably water. Um, but I think we, I, I, I do think we need to, to be careful. We are speaking, we are privileged people. I'm not talking rich. I'm talking about the fact that I know what I'm going to have for dinner after this. Even if I don't know what I'm going to have tomorrow, I'm just, there's going to be food on the table. There are a lot of people for whom this is not the case. 
okay, where they are on the line, they, they're really worried. Um, and calories are cheap, actually. Calories, calories are not very expensive. In we did um people have done the calculation, certainly in the UK. I bet you the numbers are exactly the same all over Europe, where we can get on average for 90p, which is pretty close to a euro, right? Um, we can get nearly 900 to a thousand calories. Okay. Pure calories of food. Probably chips, you know, uh, probably stuff, but how nutritionally complete is that 900 to 1,000 calories you're going to get for 90p? That's the question. And so um, we need to... I, I get annoyed when people say, replace the chocolate bar with a banana. I Because sometimes you need a chocolate bar, sometimes you need a banana. No one is saying that a chocolate bar is healthier than a banana. This is a stupid thing to say. But when you are going to eat a chocolate bar, can we make a healthier chocolate bar? Can we put more protein, right? Can we get an intermediate? Can we get more protein? Can we get more fiber in there? So that when we feel the need for a chocolate bar, you are having a little bit of health benefits. No one is calling it a health food, okay? But when you have vegetables, you have vegetables. And I think that is the kind of discussion we need to have. And that is, I, I think terms like ultra-processed foods put us back from having a... Uh, a, a sane discussion about the quality of food, what should we be feeding people? Uh, um, I think we need to have a less shouty, screamy uh, discussion about, about food. Like you said, not all ultra-processed foods are bad, but there's like a real hype, especially, maybe, like you said, for privileged people of plant-based milks and stuff like that. Mm. That's also ultra-processed. Is it bad for us or not? I got into trouble. I don't know if you saw my interview on there's this program called Skavlan. Uh, no, I didn't see that one. Okay. So what happened was, uh, uh, which is a um, Scandinavian talk show. And so I was on there and the host um, asked me the question about, now this was, a, this was he was Norwegian, but the film, the, the uh, program it largely goes out in Sweden, Sweden, Finland, Norway. Okay. And, and he asked me this exact question because we were discussing ultra processed foods about oat milk. He says, look, I've recently changed the oat milk for my coffee in the morning and says, this is ultra processed. Is it bad for us? So let's put it this way. Do you know, I did a program once, another program a little while back on how, how oat milks are made. Okay. So the way you make oat milk, and this is going to say, and I said it in a slightly lighthearted fashion and got into trouble with Oatly. Now, I don't, I don't know if you have Oatly where you um, um from. I didn't realize Oatly was a Swedish company, but I wasn't trying to be rude about it. I was just explaining. So what happens is you take oats, you soak it with uh, um, water so that the white, the white cup color. Now, there is some fiber in there as well. Okay. What then happens is you take this white water, which doesn't taste of anything at all. Okay. And it's completely watery. And so what you then need to do is you need to make sure that you put in the fatty flavor of milk so that you can froth it in the cappuccino and, and what have you. So you do it with rapeseed oil. Okay, you put a percentage of rapeseed oil into this. Now you need to get flavor into your, into your milk and you need to get some nutritional content. So you begin to fortify the milk, quote unquote milk, okay? Iron, calcium, this, that, vitamins, minerals. And then you take the whole thing and you go whoop and it becomes oat milk, all right? now. If you, if I explain it like that, some people are going, I don't eat oat milk. I think there is nothing wrong with oat milk if you want to drink oat milk, to, 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 to my mind. This is, I think, a classic example. Now, I got into trouble because I, I explained this and the, the host of the program then said, it's black coffee for me from now on. And the problem was Oatly's uh, 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 switchboard because it's Oatly's you know, home country, lit up like a Christmas tree. The next day, I got, I got a, a, a email from the Oatly representative dietetics, uh, uh, dietitian in the UK going, oh, Professor Yo, we saw your interview last night. Uh, um, and I wasn't trying to say, so my answer is this, this sits in the same class of people preaching too much about ultra processed foods, but actually oat milk, and how much have you got? Clearly, if you drink too much of it, you're going to get fat because there's a lot of oil, there's fat in there, right? But it's an ultra processed food that is not particularly bad for you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought if you are 
um, lactose intolerant like myself, but you wanted a white coffee, what the hell are you supposed to do? I mean, you could use soy, I guess, or coconut milk. When I mean, Each of them have their pluses and minuses. Coconut milk makes your coffee taste like a green chicken curry. I don't want my coffee to taste like green chicken curry, right? If you <laughs> and, and I drink soy milk because I'm Chinese. But if you want oat milk, you should be able to have it with your milk rather than have a judgment placed on it because of something called ultra process. Like, equally... You don't want to say it's healthier for you because it's vegan either. Do you know what I mean? I think we need to be just be less labels, more precise in our in our use of language. And in general, when talking about uh, vegan and vegetarianism, uh, you have gone vegan for your show. It was you had some health benefits from that. So, what what do you think should we become vegan or at least a few days in a week or so? Um, there is a big, huge, gigantic difference. I know you understand this, but just we need to we need to set this down between being vegetarian and being vegan. Okay, I think it's very easy to be vegetarian and be healthy. Very, very easy because milk and eggs, in particular, okay, are nutritionally complete. So you can be and they're and milk and eggs are not expensive, largely speaking. So leave aside vegetarianism because I think you can be unhealthy or healthy as a vegetarian. Okay, clearly, clearly you can get okay, but. It is an easy way to live and be healthier if you want to be vegetarian. Veganism is very, very different because you need to supplement. I think you need to watch vitamin B12, your iron levels, calcium levels, all of these things are not impossible to do. Okay, I did it. I made sure I studied it. I understood what I was doing. But it is a privileged choice. And people, every time I say this, I get into trouble with the militant vegans. Not, I know a lot of vegan friends. The, 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 the people who says it's only veganism and nothing else. It is a privileged choice, okay? Because a lot of people, if you are poor or food insecure, you're not going to worry about your pulses and where am I going to get my B12 supplementation? You know, where am I going to get my iodine from? You're not going to be thinking about that. You want to feed your kids, okay? And so you can be vegan and be healthy. You can be vegan and be unhealthy as well. You can eat chips the entire time. That's not good for you. But you definitely can be vegan and healthy. But it is a choice. It is not the cheapest way to, 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 to be. Vegetarianism is easier to do. If you want to be vegetarian and be healthy, I think that's a way to go. If you're poor, vegetarianism, I think is the way to go as well. I totally agree that we are privileged and it's a privilege to be able to choose foods like that. Uh, do you think it's a solution or should we consider, for example, taxing some of the ultra processed foods and using those taxes to actually make healthy foods cheaper? Ah, okay. So I think we need to do something. Taxation is always to me a slightly blunt tool um, mm -hmm. because it always disproportionately affects poor people and makes lawyers rich, but we leave that aside. Um, but you have to consider. So I, I think we need to compartmentalize what we do for certain sectors of society. The people, I, I don't want to make assumptions about who will listen to your podcast, but I assume that broadly speaking, the people that listen to your podcast are the people I teach at school here and the people who watch the things, relatively middle-class people, professionals, and so therefore we we probably you know should be taking some advice and everything like this from it. And so I think we need to be given a certain set of advice. There are, however, going to be people who are unable to follow the advice. Okay. And so how do we ensure that they also stay healthy as a default? How do we make the healthy choice, the cheaper, easier, and equally tasty choice if possible? Okay. And so, yes, I think taxing ultra processed foods, sugar, unhealthy foods is a way to go, but it can only be accompanied by making some healthier foods cheaper. Because you go into a store with 10 euros or 10 pounds, okay, and you are Mrs. Smith, and you have two kids to feed, and you have worked two jobs already, okay? You still need to get the food on the table. You need to leave with not enough food to feed everybody in the house. If it's going to be healthier, how do we get that 10 euros to actually, uh, to Mrs. Smith, to make sure she gets a healthy meal out of them. Because at the moment, the cheapest option is to get five frozen pizzas uh, from, from, from the free freezer. It's a lot of calories. It's easy to, it's easy to cook um, versus something healthier. How do we incentivize the food system so that the default, so that if you were Mrs. Smith, because look, I, I, I can choose to eat 
to go to McDonald's tomorrow if I wish. It's my business. It's my, it's my you know, um, yes, I could lose some weight, but I chose to do it. But if you have no choice but to do it, how do you how do you incentivize? How do you make sure that Mrs. Smith becomes healthy as well? Healthy health should not be, it is, but it should not be a privilege that we only enjoy. How 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 do we get someone who's poorer that? And I think this discussion around ultra processed foods is unhelpful for tackling health equalities or inequalities uh, when, when, when we're discussing. I, I, I think um, more precision in the way we talk about food, I think understanding solutions are going to differ from different sectors of society, for different cultures. This is also important to, 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 actually, to actually think about because it's easier, obviously, to be a vegetarian in India, okay, because there's a huge culture of it there compared to being a vegetarian here in the UK, it just it just is. People say, well, it's not difficult. But culture does make a difference. So I think we need to take all of this into account when we're discussing our food rather than judge people for what they do or don't do. Yeah. And I, I also I again I agree, because if you if you just tax the unhealthy food without making the healthy food cheaper, you're just screwing over people who don't have a lot of money. Exactly. One final question before we close. Are there some foods? maybe suggestions you can make for people that are some dietary suggestions that everyone should be able to follow? So I, this is at the end of that of that book of mine, actually, the Why Calories Don't Count book. Um, and uh, because when I turned an initial draft in to my editor, he uh, they read the book, um, they liked it. This, this is a negative book. It's got no solutions. So anyway, actually, I did go think, think about it. And Within keeping, because I am a big believer that there is no right diet. You need to find a diet that suits you. Otherwise, you won't stick to it. And therefore, it's why, why think about it. But I think there are some probably loose rules that we can follow. So what to count instead of calories? I think I've listed that section as. And so I think we need to consider a number of different things. I think we need to consider the amount of protein we're eating. Um, there is a sweet spot. And it tends to be around 16%. Now, this assumes a number of different things. This assumes you're not a growing child and you're not an old person in the hospital, and you're not an Olympic athlete, which is most of us, okay? So so uh, for most of us, 16% of protein um, is, is, is the sweet spot. Too much, and it begins to stress your kidneys out for removing all the nitrogen, okay? Too little, we don't grow. 16%, that number, protein. 5%, okay? That is the amount of free sugars we should try and limit what we eat. Now, free sugars are sugars that have been juiced out, uh, uh, honeyed out, maple syruped out, or pure sugar. But uh, And we need to keep it to 5% of our energy levels or, or, or below. But if you eat a, a fruit, if you eat something with fiber in it, then the fiber limits the amount of sugar. So well, I'm not counting anything with actually fiber in it. How about fiber? 30 grams of fiber a day. Now, what does that mean? It's very difficult. But at the moment, on average, we are probably we in higher income countries are probably only eating 15, maybe 20 grams of fiber. We need to double the amount of fiber we actually eat, more fruits and vegetables, because that's where. So in essence, what I'm saying is we need to make sure we have a moderate amount of protein and eat more fruits and vegetables. And then work that, work that into your dietary plan of choice. Are you a keto? Well, okay. Yeah, you know, you know, are you Mediterranean? Well, okay. Um, or are you vegan? Well, okay. Um, you can fit those rules, quote unquote, into those uh, dietary dietary approaches. Now, you can choose. You'd ask whether or not we should be going vegetarian slash vegan. I think for the health of the world, because obviously there are different reasons why people become vegan. Obviously, uh, uh, ethics, which is um, um, environment. I think we need to discuss this. Health, that one depends what you what you're doing, but I do think that actually we should eat less meat. Whether or not it works being vegan once or twice a night or just cutting your meat, uh, not eating meat at breakfast or not eating meat at lunch, whatever, however you do it, I do think that uh, we would see health benefits and planetary health benefits if we cut down on 10, 20% of the meat we eat. This was the 25th episode of Apple Finch Pudding. I want to thank Giles Yeo for the information and let's meet again for the next episode of Apple Finch Pudding. Mm -hmm.